Hello, I'm Paul Kearney. I'm Professor of Politics and Public Policy at the University of Stirling. And this is a presentation to go with the article UK Government's Imaginative Use of Evidence to Make Policy. So I will do it in a PowerPoint slide and I'll record the audio too. Uh, as you can hear, I'm recording this at home, so I've got the indoor voice. And if you hear any loud barking noises, that just means that the post has come. So let's begin with the meaning of the title. Now there are two meanings of imaginative to talk about here. One is that it's a sort of a sarcastic term, a euphemism for ridiculous. And I think that's often how people describe some aspects of, of evidence use in government. Now the first way in which people criticize evidence use is they make reference to this phrase, policy-based evidence rather than evidence-based policy. So they're not using the evidence correctly. Now, in that case, think about uh, scientists or researchers who have an idea about how to use the, you know, the best or the highest quality information to reduce uncertainty about the severity of problems. More information, less uncertainty. Then think about people saying, well, a lot of this government policy is, is cynical. They're not making the correct choices because there's something wrong with their beliefs. They understand and portray policy problems incorrectly. They're, you know, there's something wrong with their values, their beliefs. They, they portray populations wrongly and they make choices on that basis. So in that case, think of the idea that uh, everyone, including policymakers, use our beliefs to reduce ambiguity. And ambiguity refers to the potential for many different ways to interpret the world and interpret policy problems within them. So we can produce more information to reduce uncertainty, but actually to reduce ambiguity, we use our beliefs and values and we exercise power to, to dominate the process in which we understand the world. So two very different things. So you can follow that up on a, a 500 word blog post on uncertainty and ambiguity. The second meaning of imaginative is more positive. It suggests, you know, policymakers and governments, they have to be creative with evidence. They can't just use evidence as a sort of, sort of magic bullet that will tell them what to do. So they have to be imaginative in two ways. First is in the presentation of evidence. Okay, so they have to understand uh, evidence in a particular way. And you have to frame the consequences to people in a particular way. So, you know, the idea there is there's no objective way to produce and understand evidence. This is about being creative to get people to understand the evidence in a particular way. The second way in which they have to be creative is that there's never enough evidence to completely reduce uncertainty. So they have to sort of go beyond the evidence, think about what happens in the future, and envisage the outcomes of their choices in the future. And that's one, one key problem with evidence is that it tells you what happens in the past, but it doesn't really tell you what will happen when you make choices for the future. So they have to be imaginative. Now imagine these definitions competing in three ways. So the background here is that these are usually the three things I would talk about uh, to researchers when they're trying to work out why policymakers don't always pay attention to their evidence. You know, three, three main explanations that we can follow up in a separate post. But imagine a conversation between uh, one of those researchers or a critic of government policy and the policymaker themselves. Now, the first one would be about the best use of the best evidence. So a researcher might say, well, you don't use the evidence. You, you, you ignore it or you cherry pick it. Now, a policymaker might respond, well, you don't really know what the evidence is. Now, there is a lot of debate uh, within politics and within academia about what counts as the best evidence. And I think look out for that because some people will associate the best evidence with something like a hierarchy of evidence based on methods in which randomised control trials are near the top, expertise is lower down, and things like uh, practitioner experience and services of feedback are or near the bottom. Now you don't find that same attachment to evidence hierarchies uh, in, in most parts of government. They often don't find it in, in lots of professions or academic disciplines. So, you know, you might be used to thinking in say social policy or social work or education about a, a different uh, 
relationship with evidence in which there's much more respect for experience, uh, you know, trial and error, learning, and, uh, you know, uh, serve issues or feedback and such like. So the idea that, that governments don't use the evidence, I think, does it, it, it's not always clear what that means. The second one, which is often, uh, you know, you would often find this in politics, you know, uh, so a researcher would say, you know, you're making irrational choices. You're not making well, well thought out reasoned choices. Now, the policy might, uh, maker might respond, if they're being honest, you know, they would have to be honest about this, they would say, you think I'm irrational because you don't understand the pressure I'm under. Now, that refers to a wide body of work on, you know, things like psychology and decision making that say, Everyone combines cognition and emotion to make choices. You know, there is no uh, rational, irrational distinction to separate people. We're, essentially, we're all making so-called rational and rational choices. Now, policymakers have the added problem that they have to, uh, you know, uh, manage a huge amount of information and make choices in a, in a restricted period of time. They often don't have the luxury of, of, of a long term to think about choices. So. They, like all humans, they have to combine cognition and emotion, and often they have to do that relatively quickly, under much more pressure. The third thing is, you know, someone might say, you're not following due process, you're imposing policy rather than you know, going through a, something akin to a policy cycle or something like that. And if policymakers are being honest, the response would be, well, I don't control that process. I'm part of a, a complex policymaking system in which I make a contribution, but I'm not really sure what happens next. Now, of course, politicians you know, tend not to say that, but I think that's what they would say if they were reflecting on their career. Now, uh, putting up some images uh, in which people uh, portray the policy process in different ways. So, you know, in a nutshell, the one on the top left is the kind of classic policy cycle, which gives this idea of a kind of very simple orderly process. The one in the top right is an example of uh, policymakers being much more uh, realistic about what their process is. You know, it's a big kind of mess, a big kind of spaghetti graph. There are lots of policy theories that give, uh, you know, different metaphors for how, you know, what the policy process is like. So the bottom right is, is associated with multiple streams and you can, you can follow that up. And that just really suggests that lots of things have to come together at the, at the right time for, for big policy choices to be made. And some of them are in the control of individuals, but some of them are, 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 are environmental. And on the bottom left is a sort of a thing that I've knocked up to say, you know, here's, a, here's a, just a simple diagram, but you would have to understand each concept in turn to understand the policy process. You've got choice in the middle, and then you've got a complicated a complex policymaking environment surrounded by you know many rules, networks, uh, lots of events, the dominant dominant ways to understand policy problems, and all these things take place at many levels and types of government. So that's the sort of thing we're trying to to harness. We're we're to some extent we're getting away from this idea of a very small number of well informed people at the heart of government who are who are who have the power to get what they want and move towards this very large, complicated uh, process containing many actors who are not really sure how to get what they want. Now add to this the question that we've been focusing on, which is uh, a lack of evidence-based policy making. Now, the next point to bear in mind when we get into the case study is that there are many ways to, to make policy well. You know, there are many models of good governance and evidence-based or evidence-informed is just one of many. So for example, you know, you could have an equally defendable process in which it's largely deliberative or participatory. You know, focus very much on, on collecting many views rather than simply collecting a lot of evidence. Now, of course, you might want both of those things, but you know, you have to make these choices about what, what are the things you prioritize in a, in a good policy process. Even if you focused on evidence and foreign policy making, there are many models for doing it based on the kind of questions we talked about there about uh, what makes for the best evidence and based on how, for example, how centralist or how, uh, you know, how much subsidiarity or localism you would like to tolerate in a, in a political system. So here are three sort of basic ideal type approaches. You know, you don't quite find them in practice, but they, they, they sort of take in the, the essence of each approach.
And you can see that there are three, and the first two kind of contrast with each other. So if you imagine, one of them is very much focused on taking the so-called best evidence from randomized controlled trials and, and experimental methods, uh, and then making sure that the implications of that evidence are, are, are met in full within a political system. So how do you, you know, roll out best practice where you have a uniform model based on the evidence, and you have to have high fidelity to that model. And the aim you prioritize is the thing that is making this intervention work. And contrast that with the, 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 the one I've called storytelling, which is you have much more respect for practitioner knowledge and service user feedback. You scale up best practice uh, by uh, inviting people to tell stories to each other about their experiences, and they learn from your experience if it's comparable and useful. And your aim is very much to focus on governance principles like uh, localism and respect for service users. Then you have approaches which are some kind of mix of both of those, either the best or the, the worst of both worlds. So you gather evidence uh, you know, through a kind of eclectic, uh, more, more pragmatic set of methods, and you encourage people to experiment on the ground through trial and error. You scale up with a kind of maxim uh, you know, for local uh, practitioners, if it's working, keep doing it. If it's if it's not working, stop doing it. A name you prioritise is everyone's got the same kind of training and uh, they feed back to each other about what's working and not. So you imagine we've we'll, we'll started on with we've started with this idea, you know, that there are a lot of criticism of of, of government policy because it's not evidence based. Now we're kind of complicating things and saying, well, you know, there are at least three ideal type models of what counts as evidence-based or, or evidence-informed. Now we can really, um, if we add the kind of political process to that, you can really complicate things much further. With this slide, which is in the, the article. And uh, so we won't, we won't dwell on each and every word, or if you want to, you should really pause the, the PowerPoint. Uh, but if you imagine, what I'm trying to suggest here is that um, you can describe a process of using evidence and only some examples are clearly uh, categorized as evidence-based policymaker or policy-based evidence. You know, so uh, if, you, if, if you're a purist for an evidence-based policy approach, you would want the science or the research evidence on policy problems and the effective solutions to come first. Then you would want policymakers to select the best interventions according to you know, scientifically driven evidence and criteria. Okay. Or you would say, oh, it's policy-based evidence if uh, you start with policymaking, policymakers identify a problem, then they rely on things like their personal experience or they, or they cherry-pick information to get what they want. But there are lots of categories of evidence use within that spectrum that is it's, it's more difficult to make sense of. So, you know, for example, you can use lots of scientific evidence and then make a choice based on uh, other things like value for money, or uh, you can use lots of evidence and then and make an ideological electoral choice. You can identify a problem based on your values and then, you know, seek reliable research evidence. You know, there's lots of examples in which it's not quite sure what would count as what kind of category. And even then, those are just sort of 12 examples. You know, there are lots of kind of complex processes in which it's hard to piece together how people came to decisions and what information and beliefs they used. So I would say the, the sort of take home from this is that you, I think you could, if you analysed any case study, it'd be very difficult to find a very discrete clearly defined, well-ordered process in which was, there was a clear reliance on specific evidence. You know, so, so it's a kind of ideal standard to which uh, no example of policymaking could live up. Okay, so let's use that kind of understanding to inform the, the case study we have here. And it's on the UK government's so-called trouble, Troubled Families Programme. And you might say that that's part of a wider focus on what we would call families policy. And that's, so families policy is quite hard to define, but it would include lots of other things that affected, fa you know, fa family life in, in more general, if indeed you could define a family. But it'd be things like, uh, you know, uh, tax credits and, and taxation or, uh, or, you know, early, early years education, you know, uh, early years uh, 
healthcare or, or wider support. You know, so it's um, or you know, criminal justice aspects of families policy. So think of troubled troubled families program as something relatively discreet, but within a much more complicated context. Now. The reason I uh, use this case study a lot is that it, it looks, or aspects of it, look like the most egregious examples of policy-based evidence. And there's a lot of literature you can follow up on, on how people have characterised their use of evidence. Now this slide has the, uh, the most important example, and it's associated, I think, with uh, David Cameron, so remember him. That uh, what they did was they said a troubled families policy is essentially we will identify just under 120,000 troubled families in England, primarily in England. We will define them as troubled if they meet three general criteria. One is one of the children has been subject to an antisocial behaviour order. The second is they have been absent from school too much. And the third is uh, they have a parent on benefits or you know unemployed. Then they identify ways in which they can demonstrate success in turning around their lives. And the, the, the evidence for success in turning around a family's lives is change in one of these measures. And what the UK government did was essentially link funding for the programme to local authorities with local authority declarations of success. And lo and behold, almost every local authority declared success in almost every case. So essentially, they, they describe almost 100% success of this programme before they said, well, let's roll it out to, to 400,000 families. Okay, now the second use of maybe, uh, you know, less egregious, but more, you know, but just as um, interesting use of evidence is to do with the modern use by governments of, of, of neuroscientific information, often accompanied uh, ideally with visual, dramatic, memorable images of, of scans of brains. So that's what you get in this picture of a, there were two reports done by Graham Allen from the UK government, and they present this idea of uh, if you see this picture, you probably would have seen it before, where you have two scans of, of, of three-year-old children. One is a normal, healthy brain of a well-looked-after three-year-old, and one is a remarkably, worryingly small brain associated with a three-year-old subject to extreme neglect. Now, that sort of imagery is associated with this idea that uh, it's, it's, it's a now-or-never argument. You'll also find in the you know things like the Monroe Report, which suggests the damage is done physically and visually to the brain before age three. And you can find out this kind of damage through brain scans and other things like, you know, you can measure levels of stress in young in, in children by taking a sample of their hair and, and testing it for cortisol levels. You know, it's a kind of super scientific looking approach to identifying a hugely important problem that you all have to solve very quickly. Now, in this case, it's worth following up the literature that I highlight that suggests, you know, they're, they're, they're slightly more polite about this, but they suggest that these things are, are made up or they're exaggerated to the point at which it becomes a kind of, uh, you know, an almost cynical use of worrying visuals to justify uh, the, the use of, of government intervention. As you can see, this one's a bit different. This isn't declaring success. This is declaring a highly vivid, uh, urgent policy problem to which governments need to react. So there are two different ways to use evidence or, you know, or abuse evidence, if you prefer. Okay, now there are some examples in this field where governments appear to use evidence more sincerely but find that it's difficult to do so. Now, I think that's the point of these next two slides. You know, they, what if they were, they were the most sincere people we'd ever met and they were engaging with this kind of evidence? What would happen? Now, the first is they would try and evaluate domestic pilot projects. And these are so-called family intervention projects, which began with the Dundee Families Projects and has really expanded. And there are two types. There is the one which is intensive, 
on-site uh, intensive uh, interventions where essentially a, a family deemed at risk stays in residential accommodation surrounded by a huge amount of, of public services. The other is more of an outreach service in which they have access to many public services through a kind of contact point. And then, so imagine how do they evaluate this kind of thing about, you know, about you know, uh, family life being turned around. The first thing they do is they interview staff on the project and families on the project to ask them if there have been improvements in, in the family life. Then they go through in some detail the case reports describing projects. And in, in, in this case, you know, these are not randomized controlled trials. They're not controlled or experimental. Essentially, this is a counterfactual. What would have happened if we had not intervened in their lives? Now, the reports tend to be, uh, you know, um, tentatively positive. They said, you know, we think that the, these, these uh, families' lives are, are better than if they had not been subject to this project. Okay, but it's more difficult to know what was the cause of the improvement. So it seems to be this kind of general uh, reference to better coordination of public services. You know, so, so people engage with a kind of complex policymaking system and don't quite know where to start to seek support. So the solution is residential or, or um, non-residential support through key contacts. You know, so you can speak to all the, all the people you need to speak to at the at the main, uh, you know, at a particular time. And the interesting thing is, if you are a kind of evidence purist, uh, and, and there have been reviews of this kind of work, they say, you know, the, the quality of the evidence is not there to make these conclusions. The second causal driver could be that they are essentially studying people who are deemed to be, uh, you know, at, at their last chance. You know, they're they're close to being homeless, uh, the parents are close to losing their children to social care. So, you know, th there's a huge urgency to, to deal with problems at this, at this particular case, which wouldn't be true when you're rolling out these programs to 400,000 families. Okay, then consider another way to use evidence is to go for randomized controlled trials, which in this case largely come from other countries like the, the US and Australia. You have very specific interventions and your, your focus is on fidelity to those interventions. So the kind of key ones in this field are the, the family nurse partnership, which started as a nurse family partnership in the US, and Triple P in Australia, an incredible US from the US. Uh, now, th these have been imported in some way in the UK based on evidence of success from other countries. Then they've been evaluated in the UK to see if they're successful here. Now, the kind of nascent evidence suggests that the Family Nurse Partnership, the first, the first RCT of, of that showed a very limited short-term effect. And I think part, part of the explanation comes from different contexts. Imagine in the US, often the, the distinction was between a very limited service and a very good service. In the UK, the comparison is between a good service and a good service. So I think that's partly why it would show less effect. Other projects I think you could follow up. You know, Triple P has an interest in more controversial history based on critics saying that most reports about success come from people with some kind of interest in declaring their success. You know, the authors are you know, are, are also the, the originators. Um, but probably for me, the, the more interesting one is Incredible Years, which has a higher reputation, more evidence of success in more areas, including the UK. But you can follow this up in a few extra blog posts. What, what that seems to suggest to me is they have the most success at this point of emergency. You know, the, you know, a, for example, a GP has, a reser has um, referred a child to a specialist and the GP and the specialist have told the family that this is, you know, this is an urgent need to, to intervene to, you know, to, to help uh, the, the child with behavioural problems. What they don't show is the same level of success when they try and provide the same level of service, you know, 
to uh, you know uh, a wider population that doesn't that doesn't perceive that emergency, or a, a smaller population based on people identifying risk, you know, from from you know a, a sort of sort of factors associated with so-called troubled families. You know, it's not it's a very different process to refer someone to a specialist for a specific problem and to tell families that they think they're at risk because of their, for example, their socioeconomic background. So, you know, it has most effect at the kind of last resort. And that doesn't seem to be in keeping with the, the overall aim of this policy, which is to intervene as early as possible to, to put off these kind of problems. Okay, so imagine what you would do if you were really sincere um, what you would do with this kind of evidence. Now, I think there are three ways you could interpret it. One is supportive, one is critical, and one is careful. Okay, so the supportive one is we think these interventions work, but we don't know exactly how much they work and why they work. Now, the moral or take home from that could be keep doing it while, while it works. It doesn't matter so much why, as long as it does. The second approach is more critical. And so I've given you this thing to, to follow up with a specific type of study or evaluation which says the weight of evidence suggests the approach doesn't work. So the take home message is stop doing it. Now I think that's done by uh, you know, some authors or a group of authors who also have um, you know, documented uh, concerns about the rationale for doing it in the first place. So this is a combination of this is a bad idea morally and the evidence suggests that it doesn't work anyway. Now the third is uh, more careful, which you might say is a kind of um, one approach to evidence and, and research is to just uh, keep accumulating and, and learning from evidence along the way. So that would be, we don't know if, how and why these things work, so we need more evidence. Of course, the question there is what you do while you're gathering more evidence. I think that probably the third one, the careful one, is more in keeping with the first statement, which is let's keep doing it and gathering more evidence and then decide later if we should keep doing it. Now, what would we expect a UK government to do? One is it could simply do nothing and say that it's powerless to do anything. About, you know, it can't turn lives, family life around and maybe the state shouldn't be too involved anyway, so let's let's stop trying. Now, it's not likely in a Westminster system. You know, the Westminster system has a process in which our main electoral focus is on electing a party which elects a government, and there's a concentration of power in the executive, and the idea is you know who to blame or praise because you know who's in charge. Now, elected uh, or governments in this kind of system tend not to say we're not quite sure what to do here. They tend to say we're in control, look at our outcomes. You know, that, that's partly how you would explain the, the success story of the Troubled Families programmes. You know, UK governments in this position are under huge pressure to declare their own success, given the, the, the kind of electoral competition they, they face. And that, that essentially helps explain this, the second one, which is you declare success and move on. You know, I think that's often that's really what the Ca the, the Cameron government did when he was there, which is, um, you know, we're successful, we turned our lives around, okay, so it shouldn't be as high profile anymore. But they also, I think, I, th I think the evidence suggests that they also did the third thing, which is they declared success, but at the same time they delegated a lot of the detail to local public bodies and uh, you know people like social work professions. Now, I think that is um, a more common outcome than you might think if you just focus on high profile, high salience, exciting Westminster politics. What governments tend to do is focus their attention on a very small number of things and delegate the rest. Uh, we, we tend to focus on, on some of those things and, and, and not pay attention to the rest. But I th and I think that's what gave some space for people to make sense of families' policies in more general at more local levels of government. You know, because when central governments focused very much on declaring success so early, it meant that they paid much less attention to actually what was going on on the ground. Okay, so what can we take from that kind of initial discussion of context of evidence and, and the case study? 
Well, the first thing I would say is, I think that whenever you hear the phrase evidence-based policymaking or policy-based evidence or cherry-picking evidence or you know, things like that, I would see them as political slogans. You know, people use evidence-based policymaking, I think, either to say the government's not doing enough of it or for governments to say, oh, look at how evidence-based we are. You know, we must be doing well. And I think policy-based evidence is simply a political slogan to criticise government. And it's often based on this combination. You know, you're doing the wrong thing and the evidence uh, suggests that you're, 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 you're doing it badly as well. Now, I think if we wanted to put those kind of processes in a wider context, we would require an, an understanding of three basic things. Uh, policymaker psychology, so that's what we've talked about, the, the combination of cognition and emotion. How do they turn uh, a huge amount of information into a small amount of choices in a very small amount of time? So uh, there, are, there are some policy theories that are particularly useful for helping us think through what they do. You know, it's things like a narrative policy framework, which goes into the stories that people tell to, to exploit psychology. And then there's uh, the social construction of policy design type work by Schneider and Ingram that says that policymakers, they, they either exploit st social stereotypes strategically or they, they draw on their own emotions to identify, you know, populations that are good and, and worthy of government benefits and populations that are bad and worthy of punishment. So more, more understanding of the processes that they go through would help us understand the, the use of evidence. The second thing is policy making complexity. So even in Westminster systems, I think it's a mistake to think that governments are in the process to gather and use a huge amount of evidence and get what they want after the choices they make based on it. The policy process is just not so simple. Then what we need to consider is what governments do about that when they have to juggle being pragmatic about their la lack of control and actually being in public uh, more um, robust or more confident about their actual, you know, their, their alleged amount of control. So there are these political drivers for governments to project an image of governing competence based on control even though they probably uh, in private think that they can't achieve the aims that they, that they set out. So I think that's what we need to bear in mind is that dynamic of governments projecting success and control, but actually trying to deal with less success and less control. And then finally, it's useful to separate the kinds of criticisms we've seen in these kind of case studies. The first is, uh, governments are using evidence in the wrong way or they're not using the evidence. The second is their beliefs are wrong and their choices are wrong on that basis. You know, so what I would suggest you do from that is to follow up on this idea of uncertainty and ambiguity, to separate them analytically. You know, so what is it they're allegedly doing wrong? Are they not producing enough information to reduce uncertainty? Or are they using their beliefs uh, too much to influence their choices? And of course, in practice, you can't really separate those two things as well. You know, people are combining their understanding of the world with their demand for information. So that's worth following up. OK, so the final thing you can take home is that obviously I didn't get any posts today because the dogs are very quiet. Uh, if they do start barking, I'll let you know. Hello, I'm Paul Kearney. I'm Professor of Politics and Public Policy at the University.